Fun. Welcome to In Frame Out's Year in Film, where we take stock of 12 months of spectacular cinema and unfortunate rubbish. For a year where cinema supposedly died before getting unceremoniously yeeted into a bleached grave, this is the hardest film of the year list I've made. So much so, I had to cut some of the most wonderful movies that saw 2020 releases in the UK on the technicality that they came out much, much earlier in the United States, whilst many others got narrowly pipped to the post by our 12 final picks. Having killed our darlings and bitten the bullet, here are entries 12 through 7 of our best films of 2020. Why'd you lie to me about seeing my movies? Why'd you lie to me about your husband? I've been lying since the second I got here. Black Bear spends its first half establishing itself as an intensely watchable domestic thriller, when a train wreck couple takes in an enigmatic filmmaker weighed down with a bout of writer's block. Cue bickering and delicious drama. Aubrey Plaza cashes in on all the clout she's built up, with winning aplomb in Parks and Rec and Ingrid Goes West, for the most ambidextrous work of her career, as an unreliably obtuse, exposed wire of a woman. After setting up a chain reaction of wine fueled eruptions, everything gets more than a little Mulholland Drive, as Black Bear sets its sights on the nature of film production. To what extent is acting just selling dishonesty? Is directing an accepted form of emotional manipulation? This is a meta, melodramatic head scratcher about how a fruitful creative collaboration can irreparably salt the earth from which it grows and the subjectivity and morality of supposedly autobiographical fiction. It bites off more than it can chew and doesn't quite stick the landing, but even its less palatable ideas leave plenty of food for thought. Objectively, I could never figure out why, why looking at a person should be any more interesting than looking at any other thing. Like, say, a bicycle, or a beautiful sunset, or a nice bag of potato chips. But yeah, looking at people, that's the best. Regardless of your fondness for Talking Heads or David Byrne's eclectic latter-day solo material, American Utopia is an exuberant, jubilant party that needs no invitation or prior knowledge to enjoy. Stripping away all the cables, mic stands, drum racks and superficial distractions of even the most aesthetically pleasing concert environment, this isn't just a collective of world-best musicians strutting barefoot to the rhythm and flow of these avant-garde bangers. Annie B. Parsons' choreography, Spike Lee's energetic but never showy direction, and the hilarious raconteur digressions Byrne makes between songs means that calling this a concert film feels oddly reductive. There's postmodern dance, charming oratory interludes, crowd participation, and that's before we get to the pitch-perfect, mesmerising musicianship itself. By the time the twinkling introduction of Once in a Lifetime came cascading through my home theatre system, my partner and I couldn't help but dancing around our living room like a pair of grinning dickheads. American Utopia is a communal celebration of music and movement in a year where those simple pleasures were snatched away, and by God was it needed. The human cost of war is seldom presented with as much emaciated spirit and visceral anguish as the harrowing but hopeful beanpole. It's a bleak, at times oppressively harsh experience, where the most painful moments are born out of a misguided, desperate attempt to hold fast to what little happiness there is. With delicate brushstrokes of beer bottle green and rusty browns, director Kantemir Balagov and cinematographer Ksenia Sarida expertly paint the scar tissue of a Russia slowly trying to stitch itself back together. But it's all presented with just enough hints of autumnal glow to suggest maybe things won't always be this horrible. Victoria Miroshishnenka and Vasilisa Perelgina are devastating as best friends who accidentally and intentionally destroy one another's lives in unspeakably cruel ways. 
Their performances find complicated humanity in such broken people that it's almost unbelievable that for both of them this is their sole acting credit. Tough but with just the right amount of tenderness, Beanpole is a gorgeous but gruelling display of strength from the down but never out. As a local radio DJ and plucky part-time switchboard operator in 1950s New Mexico tried to track the source of an ominous, unexplained signal, their small town life suddenly becomes part of something infinitely bigger than either can comprehend. Capturing the potent blend of Cold War paranoia and get-up-and-go Americana, there's an odd electric energy to this mid-century throwback. However, unlike with the recent spate of 80s pastiches that prefer cheap references over nodding reverence, The Vast of Night has a modern, quietly confident command of its central mystery that never panders to conventions. While there are several technically impressive long takes and continuous tracking shots, which deserve their fair share of praise, the real immersion comes from the film's two extended, visually empty monologues. First time filmmaker Andrew Patterson strips away the artifice and demands that we use our imagination to fill in the fog with our own otherworldly imagery. And it works better than any special effects heavy set piece possibly could. An engrossing, original take on classic science fiction staples that's more than the sum of its already impressive parts. Riz Ahmed is an actor slash polymath of such enormous versatility, it's shocking just how rarely he's been fully utilised out with a small handful of calling card roles. So it's with fist pumping pride that I can report, Sound of Metal is a vehicle for Ahmed's saccharine free, go for broke but never overblown performance. This musician loses hearing and learns to live and redefine what he values the most narrative could so easily have coasted on Oscar bait blandness or cheap platitudes, but instead we're given the nuanced path rarely taken with this brand of drama. As Darius Marder's second screenplay after The Place Beyond the Pines, he could still maybe do with learning to trim a few things back, but Sound of Metal never remotely feels like it's appropriating or using its audiological conditions with anything less than the utmost respect as Ruben adjusts to a life that is different but far from diminished. The marriage of sound design and scene composition is truly outstanding, as meticulous swirls of grating noise and rumbling hums offer invaluable emotional perspective. With muffled ambience, an all-around incredible cast, and one of the year's definitive acting showcases at the forefront, this is a must-watch. I'm thinking of ending things. Huh? What? Did you say something? No, I don't think so. Weird. After Lucy makes the ponderous, frostbitten drive to meet her new boyfriend's parents, a simple dinner turns into an esoteric exploration of love, death, and existential malaise. More than anything, this is a faintly pathetic but still endearing quest for validation. Charlie Kaufman's idiosyncratic writing and directorial styles are in their absolute element here. Characters refuse to adhere to structured discourse, pacing sprints off or stops dead on a dime, and recollections become indistinguishable from wishful fiction. The atmosphere is eerie and obtuse, the spare lighting giving way to surrealist theatricality, but still leaving more than enough room for some off-kilter humour. Kaufman's well-worn fondness for self-reflective meta-digressions is present and accounted for, but I never felt I'm thinking of ending things was being smug or overly clever ultimately coming off as his most self-deprecating and nostalgic work since Adaptation. Its overly intertextual dialogue may not be your cup of tea, and its strange construction is sure to leave some viewers confused and frustrated, but if you're willing to commit to discomfort and play by the film's rules for a couple of hours, there's nothing else quite like it. So those were entries 12 through 7 of our best films of the year. 
Make sure to keep an eye on the channel for the rest of our lists, and tune in next week for entries 10 through 6 of the worst films of 2020. A shout out to our Patreon producers Jennifer C, Claire MD, Becky O, and Nicholas Le Revere, and all the love in the world for these amazing folks who support us over on Patreon. How many of these superb releases did you manage to catch, and how did you find them? Please get in touch and let us know your favourite films of the year, I absolutely love looking at other people's lists. Let us know in the comments below, and make sure you subscribe, like, hit the bell, all that blah blah blah. It all helps to prevent YouTube burying this channel, and if you're in a position to do so, we'd love it if you checked out our Patreon, where for as little as a dollar a month you can get your name in the credits, additional content, access to our private Discord, and a membership to the Inframe Out Film Club. As always, thank you for watching. Until next time, this is Inframe Out.